I always wanted to be a meteorologist. From a very young age, I saw the clouds moving outside in nursery school, and I ran to my teacher and said, you told us the earth moves, but we can't feel it. I'm seeing it happen, what's going on? And I was very precocious from a young age about all these weather-related questions, and I knew I was going to school to be a meteorologist. And then I got to school, and I realized I wasn't very good at weather forecasting, which is a big component of being a meteorologist. And realized it wasn't exactly how I wanted to spend the rest of my life. So I started getting more interested in environmental issues, in climate change. This was in the mid-2000s, and I was in New York State, and I saw a presentation on climate change in New York State, and I thought, this is so obvious, why can't we fix this? We've got to fix this. So then I started a path through graduate school, went out to Oregon, worked on the West Coast for a decade, and then made it to North Carolina two years ago. Climate touches everything and everybody. It touches every corner of the state, and people are making decisions every day around weather and climate, whether it's, should I have a picnic with my family outside today, to should I be building this bridge at this level to be around 50 years from now. My responsibility is to serve the state of North Carolina. That's all 10.5 million people in all 100 counties. What I do is work with end users who have a climate related decision. So that can be a transportation planner, that can be a water quality manager, it can be a farmer or just truly anybody who lives in North Carolina and worries about weather and climate. Government agencies make a lot of sense because they are thinking about their climate risks right now, but also private companies are thinking about climate change right now, especially the agriculture industry. There are all sorts of climate data sources, and my office runs one of them. The North Carolina Econet is 43 sites located around North Carolina, and it sends one-minute observations back to campus. So we have 1.5 million observations a day coming into our office on all sorts of variables like soil moisture and wind and air temperature and precipitation. But then the government's collecting a lot of climate data as well, and has been for a very long time. We have records back to the late 1800s, which tells us a lot about how North Carolina has changed. North Carolina's warmed about a degree Fahrenheit in the past century, and I know that does not sound like a lot. If I said to you today, it's going to be 77 degrees Fahrenheit, and it turns out to be 78, no big deal. You're not even going to notice the difference. But what we're talking about is a shift in the average in the background state. So all of those warm days add up to a degree Fahrenheit shift, which is pretty substantial. We're seeing a wetter North Carolina. So if you're from North Carolina and have spent any of the past two years here, you've noticed that yourselves. We see rain from hurricanes, but also just typical thunderstorms or regular spring storms that can drop two, three, four inches of rain in an hour and cause all sorts of urban flooding. We're seeing coastal erosion and sea level rise. Um, a warmer ocean is just bigger. Warmer water takes up more space. And we're also seeing melting of sea ice. And in North Carolina, our coast is very low and it extends pretty far inland. So we're seeing those impacts too. It's not hard to see on NC-12, which is the road on the Outer Banks that that is extremely close to the ocean and those houses are right there. People's livelihoods, their second homes, their vacation homes, a lot of meaningful places. But also here in the Piedmont in Raleigh, in Southeast Raleigh, neighborhoods flood almost every single time we get you know, fairly big storms. We see urban flooding in places like Raleigh and Durham, which are rapidly urbanizing. And then up in the Western mountains where the terrain adds an extra layer of complexity they can get storms that drop six inches of rain and can run down the mountains and flood out towns. And Asheville's seen some big flooding in the past few years. This is a different North Carolina than the one of 20 years ago, and 20 years from now it will be a different North Carolina than the one we're living in today. So we're expecting a temperature increase, so again the average temperature, of four to 10 degrees Fahrenheit by the end of the century. And the range is there for a few different reasons. One, this is a global problem with local impacts. So it depends on the amount of greenhouse gases that are emitted by the entire planet. If we reduce our fossil fuel use and change some of our practices, we can hit that four degree target. 
If as a planet we continue doing what we're doing, business as usual, continuing to build, use fossil fuels the way that we are, North Carolina could warm up to 10 degrees on average by the end of the century. Both four and 10 degrees, like I said, are a different North Carolina than the one we're living in, where we've warmed a degree Fahrenheit and we're already seeing impacts. We're seeing warmer days on average, but we're also seeing very warm nights. And this may not sound like a big deal. You're at home, you're sleeping, right? You know, you've got the AC on. Not everybody in North Carolina has access to air conditioning or can afford to turn their air conditioning on. Or we have people who are working outside, often farm workers, who are physiologically stressed during the very hot North Carolina days and then their bodies can't cool down overnight. And then our agriculture industry needs cool temperatures for the things that make North Carolina's agriculture great to thrive. So our stone fruits need a certain amount of chilling hours or cold temperatures to actually develop. And we're losing those pretty rapidly. And then when we think about just how we get to four and 10 degrees, that's a lot of very, very hot days with more humidity. So those days where it will almost be fatal to be outside for long periods of time, especially if you're laboring. As a climate scientist, I want to think that we won't let it get that bad, that we know enough about climate change to slow this down and mitigate some of the impacts. We are running out of time. And the way I like to phrase it is, if you fall asleep on the bus and you wake up, you don't wait to the last stop to get off the bus. You get off the bus as soon as you can. We fell asleep on the bus as a planet, as a country, and we need to wake up and get off the bus and change the way we use fossil fuels, change some of our transportation practices, electrify our grid, uh, enhance our infrastructure, build resilience. The worst case scenario is kind of playing out right now. It's communities of color, Low-income communities are getting hit hard by climate change, and they will continue to get hit hard by climate change. Our funding mechanisms for assistance are clunky. A lot of small communities don't have the capacity to apply for grant funding for resilience. Um, and people with a, cer a certain amount of means can get away from climate change. So there are people in harm's way right now, and it's just going to get worse. Scientists normally perform their experiment in a laboratory. And when I tell my nieces I'm a scientist, they get really excited because they think I play with potions and animals and then get very bored when they realize that's not the case. My laboratory is the planet we're living on and we're performing an experiment on it that humanity has not done before. So we have to recreate it somewhere else and that's in a computer. So we have these supercomputers that have everything that we know about the planet. The way the ocean, the atmosphere interact together, the million years of physics that I had to take and math that I had to take um, all go into this computer model. The really tough thing to figure out is people. So you can think about an argument that you've had with somebody and you maybe screamed at them, I don't know what you're thinking. Well, we have to think about and understand and try to figure out what 7.5 billion people are thinking and how they might act. So physics is easy, people are hard. Um, and we put a few different scenarios into this you know, earth that we have in the computer. And it tells us some things about the future. And it's a guidance. I can't tell you what it will be like on December 1st, 2069, but I can tell you roughly what North Carolina might look like over the next few decades. And what these climate models say for North Carolina is no matter what happens on the planet for the next two decades till about mid-century, we will continue to warm. But beyond that, so beyond 2050, beyond you know, 2080, we still have a chance to change the trajectory for future generations. And that, again, is a planetary thing, a global thing. The atmosphere doesn't stop at the borders. Everybody asks this, uh, what can I do? This is a huge global problem. And even at the state or city level, it's a huge problem to wrap your head around. And I think about this all the time, one, because I'm paid to, but two, because that's what I do. Most people don't. People have other things they're worried about, especially now with a pandemic. 
childcare, jobs, the economy, what you're having for dinner tonight, you know, the list goes on and on. And I want to let people know that you can engage in small bits. And one of the most effective things you can do is talk to people. So I'm the state climatologist and that carries a certain amount of weight and credibility, but you really love your family most of the time or your neighbors and just talking to them about what you know about climate change, your fears, your thoughts about positive changes the community can make is so effective and also voting. I want us to get away from this ideological divide on climate change and climate science. Framing it as something partisan is hugely detrimental. It affects all of us. Temperatures aren't red or blue, they are temperatures. And I think it gets really problematic when we start to you know, fight over things when we really need to be coming together. And this is both sides. So framing this as a war or a political war just isn't helpful. Let's all pitch in and save the North Carolina we love.